Canadian Reptile Girl. I'm Annalise, and this is Hobbs, my amazing Macklitz Python. I have some very serious doubts about my ability to keep him off of the mic, but we'll see how it goes. We'll see. If it wasn't obvious, snakes are very different from us, and that might make them hard to relate to for some people. This otherness helps all sorts of myths and misconceptions about snakes be accepted as truth and spread. Today, we are going to debunk some common snake myths. You may have heard some of these myths. It's even possible that you may or may have once believed some of these yourself. Heck, some of these I thought were true until I started learning more and more about snake biology and behavior. So let's jump in and see if I can shift some paradigms for you. Okay, first up is the myth that snakes are primitive brained animals with no capacity for emotion. I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on this because I'm going to be dedicating an entire video to this soon. Actually, it will be an update on a previous video that I already did on the topic. You can just see that. There. But as I've done more research, I realized that I didn't get it quite right the first time. The line of thinking that snakes are incapable of emotion is very common. It is still even prevalent in the reptile hobby to this day, with really experienced folks in the industry. But the fact is that there have been dozens of studies over the past 20 years that show that snake cognition and emotional capacity is far more advanced than what was known in the past. Snakes are very much thinking, feeling creatures. We're just bad at recognizing it when they show it to us. I will put some links to the studies in the description below, and there'll be a card up here when the updated snake intelligence video goes out later this year. Next up, snakes unhinge their jaw to eat. I've actually seen this in proper science textbooks and documentaries specifically about snakes. And this is just not true. Snake skulls and jaws are structured so that they don't need to unhinge. Unlike most animals with a jaw that connects to a solid skull, snakes have additional bones that extend the pivot point much farther back, add a kinesthetic skull and hyperelastic ligaments and skin, and they can open wide enough to swallow something five times the size of their head without dislocating anything. I did a whole video on exactly how that all works if you wanna check that out. But for now, suffice to say, they don't unhinge their jaws. Please stop saying this and teaching this in school. Thank you. Sticking with the theme of how snakes eat, let's go with one of my favorites. Big snakes will size you up before they eat you. I see this all the time on Sunny and Cher Retix page on Instagram or anytime there's a big snake lying on or near someone. Someone in the comments will invariably share the story. If you're not familiar with this, here it is! It's always from someone's sister whose friends, cousins, dogs, best friends, psychics, vet told them that the reason a pet snake stopped eating and started lying down next to them was because it was sizing them up to see if it was long enough to eat them. Hobbs, you're kind of supposed to be <laughs> Okay, first off, snakes don't eat people. Yes, there have been a very small number of instances in the last hundred years where despite one in a billion odds, a wild snake has actually managed to eat someone. But to say that snakes eat people as a general statement is categorically and demonstrably false. I mean, there are dozens, if not hundreds, of documented cases of people being eaten by rats, cats, pigs, and even dogs. Don't you dare go up there. But when you tell someone you have a pet dog, no one looks at you horrified and goes, dogs eat people, you know? And no one would say that. Because that's Moon Man talk. But oh yeah, buddy, Hobbs is gonna eat me. Mm-hmm, I'm dead, you betcha. Anyway, back to the sizing you up myth. All right, imagine, if you will, that you are a giant Burmese python in the forests of Cambodia. Your entire survival hinges on your ability to be able to quickly and efficiently subdue your prey because you never know when your next meal is going to be. So, you found the perfect spot to lie in wait, and a little deer comes along. In a flash, you immediately launch into action and stretch out next to the deer and confirm that you are, in fact, long enough to eat it. Great news, it's chow time. So, you recoil up so you can unleash your mighty strength, and you strike a, a what? The deer walked away while you were sizing it up. Huh, how about that? 
Snakes do not size up their prey. Prey comes by, they strike. That's it. So the next time you see Sunny and Cher retakes on Instagram and they're stretched out with Emmy, don't worry, the snakes do not want to eat her. They are just a couple of cool pets hanging out with their best friend. Neat, eh? I've got one more feeding-based myth before we move on to others. Big constrictors asphyxiate their prey. Another bit of reptile-related dogma you hear all the time in documentaries. You might have even learned that snakes squeeze their prey a little bit harder after every breath they take, making each of their prey's last breath a little smaller than the one before, until they die. That's not really accurate. Asphyxiation is death through lack of oxygen, which takes a bit of time. And while you certainly won't be breathing if you're a rat in the clutches of a mighty python, that's probably not the mechanism that kills you. Asphyxiation is for wimpy snakes, or maybe snakes that tackled prey a little bit too big for them. They should have sized it up first. I can't. I Moving can't. on. We now know that what constrictors typically do is squeeze so hard that it immediately overwhelms the circulatory system and the heart visibly cannot push blood against the pressure of that the snake is exerting. Unconsciousness occurs almost instantly and death via cardiac arrest shortly thereafter. The hapless rat might still appear to struggle, but really that's probably just the nerves that didn't get the memo that he's now pining for the fjords, so to speak. Once multiple loops of coils are squeezing on a prey item, that's it. The massive pressure exerted by constriction also causes potassium in the bloodstream to spike to lethal levels. So, even if the prey manages to escape the initial attack, their own blood is now toxic and they probably won't be getting very far before succumbing to a potassium-induced cardiac arrest. That hungry python will just follow along, waiting for their meal to drop dead so that they can tuck in. So what do you think of my myths so far? Learned anything new? Any of my witty jokes making you chuckle? Why not hit that like button? It lets YouTube know that other people might like this video too, and it really helps out my channel. Thanks so much. Moving on, snakes are death. I completely understand this one, because when you look at a snake's head, what don't you see? Ears, right? No ears means no hearing. Myth confirmed. Ha! Wrong! Shut up! <laughs> Snakes do have ears. They're just internal as opposed to external like ours. With no opening to the outside world, they rely more on vibrations picked up through the ground by their jawbone rather than transmitted through the air. This also means that they hear lower frequency sounds much better than higher ones. 80 to 1000 hertz is their range compared to 20 to 20,000 for us humans. Keep this in mind when you are talking to your snake. They won't hear you very well if you do the whole baby talking thing. <coughs> Wait, I do that all the time. I just did it to him. And that's why he ignores you. And he listens to me. Next up is that snakes grow to the size of their enclosure. This myth is not limited to snakes. I've heard this about turtles, lizards, even goldfish, and it is untrue for all of them. An animal's size is determined by their genetics and access to food, and in some cases, resources that allow them to properly digest, like supplements or UVB lighting for those animals that need it. If you put a baby boa and parotter in a 40 gallon tank, it will still grow to be a six to eight foot snake, or maybe even bigger. Its physical growth will not be impeded magically by a small tank, but its emotional and psychological growth certainly will be. An eight foot snake in a 40 gallon enclosure would also almost certainly have all sorts of health issues due to an inability to stretch out and move or have the appropriate heat gradient. This could also result in musculoskeletal injuries and a lack of eating. That could impact their ability to grow properly, but that is a result of severe problems with their husbandry not because the snake just stops growing when it gets a certain size in relation to their tank. In most cases, the bigger the better when it comes to enclosures. Just get your snake the extra size. They'll love it anyways. Next myth is helping a snake shed hurts the snake. This one seems to really resonate emotionally with some people, and I wouldn't be surprised if I got a nasty comment or two for debunking this myth. But hear me out. This one can be true in some situations, but in the context that you usually hear this come up, 
it's not accurate. The fervor about this myth is pretty recent and stemmed from a video a few years back from a very popular pet tuber who, in response to a video of someone helping their snake shed, stated that this practice was dangerous and helping a snake shed this way could seriously hurt your animal. There were folks who believed it as an undisputed fact without looking at context or checking for evidence. Some became extremely defensive of the content creator when they were challenged on the validity of this and it got kind of ugly. This led to a wave of comments from people who were well-meaning but factually incorrect chastising anyone posting a video, including yours truly, of a snake shedding in human hands as hurting their snake. There were even people going as far to argue the point aggressively with expert snake keepers, veterinarians, and herpetologists. People with degrees in reptile biology who were explaining that it is perfectly safe and why. Look, people make mistakes or don't explain things quite right or information changes and what was known is now not correct. Before blasting anyone online about something you feel is wrong because some YouTuber said it was, do your research. And please don't just Google the thing you already believe in word for word and go, aha, I told you when Google gives you those results back. Bit of a brand here, but that is not research. And that kind of thing is exactly why we are dealing with some of the problems in the world today right now that we really shouldn't be dealing with. Research involves looking at your own views critically, looking for data and articles supported by science and vet the sources, look for peer reviewed studies, consensus among accredited experts, and let that guide you. Not just blindly believing randos like me or anyone else on the internet. If your husbandry is correct, your snake should be able to shed perfectly without any help. However, when your snake is ready to shed on its own and the skin is rolling off easily as it should be, there is no difference between your hand being the mechanism your snake uses to shed or a rock or stick in their enclosure. Now, some snakes don't like being touched at all at any stage when they are in blue. If that's your snake, leave them alone. Also, and this is very important, you should never initiate a snake's shed. Do not pick at the scales to start them off. If the snake is not ready to shed, picking and pulling at their scales before they are ready can actually hurt your snake. So make sure you let your snake start on their own and then lend a helping hand if you want and if they are okay with it. You won't hurt them then. Next up on our tour through this house of lies, snakes will chase you down. This is another one that usually has the story that happened to a friend of someone's boyfriend's accountant's barber. The premise is self-explanatory. A snake, usually a cottonmouth for some reason, will aggressively chase you down to attack you. So, this one kind of has a grain of truth to it. Oh, I'm sure you're ruining the atmosphere, but I love you. But what's happening is not what you might think is happening. I can explain. Let me explain. To a wild snake, we are horrifying, and they want nothing to do with us. Even with the most venomous snakes, we are far more capable of killing them than the other way around. And they know that. When they encounter a human, a snake's preference is to either to hide or get away via the quickest escape route. Sometimes, in their panic, the snake thinks that the quickest route is actually behind you. In some cases, and this is more prevalent in some species than others, Looking at you, Black Racer. The snake's fear of you kind of short circuits their brain and they just pick a direction at random, which could easily be towards you and they book it. In either case, the snake darts towards you to escape, but you run away, but the snake still needs to get past you. So he keeps coming and you keep running and he keeps coming, now probably wondering what scary monster you've seen and are running from. <sighs> snake is not chasing you. You and the snake are both fleeing in sync, and who knows? Maybe at this point, he feels like the two of you are in it together. It's ride or die, baby. Okay, this is getting kind of long. What was that, like eight myths? <sighs> I think that's enough for today. But don't worry, there are still a ton of other myths I can do. If you want to see a part two, just let me know in the comments below. I'll leave you with this question. In a time where we have unprecedented access to information, why do you think that these myths persist so stubbornly? Thank you so much for watching, I hope you enjoyed my take on your common snake myths, and until next time, remember to nurture all nature. And not those myths. Nurture the truth too. Bye! <laughs> Hello? Can I help you? 
He's like, yes, I'd like one large rat pins. You're not eating this week. You're not. A billion other ball pythons named Monty. Yeah! Why is it why does it seemingly only ball pythons that are named Monty? Because ball pythons are everywhere. Ridiculous. Yeah, but when you think of a ball python, you're like, oh, it should be named Monty for Monty Python, but when you see a Burmese python, you're like, you're like, it should be named Chubber Chunk instead of Monty. Chubber Chunk. <laughs> I don't know, I had to think of something on the spot. <laughs> Are we gonna be here all day? Hmm. Well, I guess that's it. She's long enough to eat me. I've led a good life. I've had a good run. All right. Wait, where are you going? It's close to me. No. Hobbs. Hobbs. No. Hobbs. No. No. There you go. Better. Look at you. All right. Oh no. Already? <laughs> Yeah. Before succumbing to a pat, 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 pat potato. potato. <laughs> Before succumbing to a potato induced cardiac arrest. I think this one's got a weird kind of vibe to it. Yeah, it's a roller coaster. We're up and down. Oh, there's a loop de loop, and then we're over here, and there's down there, and then that's sad, but that's happy, and then we're angry again. It's heavy. Okay, but like, what What was that? Like, he always strikes it every time, but this time he's like, oh, no, it's scary. Oh, wait, it's food. Oh, I misheard you. Okay. Oh, right, I should kill it too. Yeah. Like, what? It happened to like, out of the tank. Just like, launching. Hello, food? You will be food soon if you don't do it. Food! No, he's like, oh, thank you. Must be camera shy. Yeah, must be. Yeah, that's it.